friends and family who are here. We are going to begin the services from Uriel. If you have a cell phone, I'd like you to place it in the silent mode or turn it completely off. Services will be conducted by Rabbi Nate Crane, Encanter Pavel Reutman, Beth Hillel, B'nai Amuna, and Wilmette. To our immediate family members, it's now that we will participate in the act called Kriya, which means to tear. On each one of you is a black ribbon, and this black ribbon is something that we're going to wear throughout our Shiva. We don't wear it in the evening, and we don't wear it over the Sabbath, but nevertheless, we wear it on the outside of our clothing as a representative of how we're feeling on the inside, which is torn and separated. So I'll ask you to please repeat this prayer after me. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech Ha'olam Dayan Ha'emet Adonai Natan Adonai Lakach Yehishem Adonai Merach God is the one who has given and Adonai has taken. Praise be the name of Adonai. And it's now that we will tear our ribbons. If you would like to, you may be seated. Each generation of our people have sought words of comfort. Those words of comfort in their origins come from our biblical poetry, from our songs. Within our songs, we can find messages of hope and prayer, love and yearning. And today, as we say goodbye to Mural Kazanov, what we feel is those same emotions of love and yearning, sadness, and yet celebration, such a long, incredibly well-lived life. Here together, surrounded by family and friends, both present physically, as well as those of you sharing this moment with us from home. And so it's now that we will begin our service with the words of the 23rd Psalm. The canner will lead us in the Hebrew. He will recite on our behalf, and then we will join together in the English, which can be found on the insides of our handouts. Adonai <laughs> Shafti 
We join together in the English of the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. A reading from the book of Eov of Job. Tamir chacham imet mi mevi lanu t'murato, ki yesh la kesef motza makom la zahav yazku. There is no replacing a person of wisdom. There are mines for silver and places where gold is refined. Iron is taken from the earth and copper is smelted from the rock. But where can wisdom be found and where is the source of understanding? There is no replacing a person of wisdom. There is no replacing Muriel Kazanov. The words that we've shared so far have made reference to eternity. Because within our tradition, we truly believe that we have the ability to be immortal, to continue far beyond our time here on earth. There is a season set for everything, a time for every experience under heaven, a time for planting and a time for reaping, a time for keeping and a time for discarding, a time for loving and a time for hating, a time for embracing and a time for refraining. A time for slaying and a time for healing, a time for laughing and a time for weeping. A time for dancing and a time for wailing, a time for birthing and a time for leaving this earth. A time for speaking and a time for silence. A time for seeking and a time for losing. At our service, we experience many of these motions all at the same time. One for yearning, as I spoke about earlier, a time for silence. We've lost, and so therefore we seek, like in the words of Ecclesiastes. And there is a time for silence and a time for speaking. And that is what we will do right now, to take this time to speak, to reflect on the wonderful memories, that which we miss, that which we will carry on. And so we'll begin as we hear first words from Joel, Muriel's son. When I sat down to write these words about my mother, I thought it would be easy. She was my mom for 71 years, so how could it be difficult thinking of what to say or how to say it, sharing these thoughts with our family and friends? But when it came time to put pen to paper, or more accurately, fingers to computer, I find it difficult. Over so many years, so much has happened. This does not include the years in her life before I was born. She died a few days before reaching her 98th birthday. Fortunately for her and for all of us, she led a long and beautiful life. Fortunately for me, I was privileged to be her son. So instead of a chronological recitation of her life, I am just taking a few minute moments to free flow a few random thoughts and memories in this moment that come to mind. 
some, but certainly not all, of the words that one could use to describe my mom are, first and foremost, love of family. And after that, love of Judaism and synagogue life, love of learning, love of music, love of kids, love of goodness and morality, and if you put it all together, love of life. These core attributes were nurtured from the beginning of her life and were built upon the rest of her life. She grew up in the city of Chicago and was fortunate to be exposed to much love and the trappings of a very middle-class lifestyle. Her parents, Anna and Milton, were generous with their love and wanted only the best for my mom and her dear brothers, Buddy and Larry, and her dear sister, Carol. Education, culture, Judaism, and motivation to live a good, full, and meaning in life as she, exp as she experienced growing up were obviously the foundation for my mom's personality. Her greatest love was reserved for my dad, who my mom often called Haskell the Rascal. The beauty and their devotion to each other, I am sure rubbed off on me and my sisters, which helped shape our personalities. Talk about devotion. When my dad suffered a stroke at a comparatively early age, he was unable to get out of bed and had trouble moving in any event. My mom went to the nursing home where he was living for the many years. She was there just about every single day and stayed with my dad for hour after hour, talking to him and making sure all aspects of his care were being addressed. This took a toll on my mom, but she was a very, very strong woman and survived the experience intact, although experiencing great sorrow. One very important aspect of my mother's life, as I indicated, was music. She wanted to make sure her kids loved and appreciated music as much as she did. So she started having me take piano lessons at the age of seven. My teacher was Dr. Corman, who was also the choir director at our synagogue, B'nai Amuna. Dr. Corman was a very strict disciplinarian. Practice, practice, practice was the order of the day. He told me on many occasions, if I didn't practice more, he would drop me, i.e. no more lessons. <laughs> My mom immediately began a daily discourse to motivate me. Didn't I realize that if I didn't practice more, Dr. Corman would drop me? <laughs> she sat next to me at the piano during the week, supervising practice sessions. She also sat in on piano lessons, making sure she was aware of all that needed to be accomplished prior to the next lesson. As it turned out, Dr. Corman did not drop me. At one point, my mom was driving me to jazz piano lessons in downtown Evanston, as well as my French horn lesson at the junior high school. As an aside, my music teacher at school, Mr. Majors, told me and my mother the sound of my trumpet playing in the school band sounded like a French horn. So I had better switch to the French horn. Before I knew it, she was driving me to the French horn lessons. My mother herself played the piano and played music quite often on the piano during her life, well into her 90s. She even wrote some songs. I would come over to her condo and she would ask me to listen to the latest songs she was working on. More random thoughts. I called her on the phone in the evenings, six days a week for 49 years, Saturdays were excluded. <laughs> She had a terrific memory. She would recount every little thing that she did during the day. These phone calls were very important to both of us. Once in a while, I would fall asleep on the couch and missed my call. The next day, the first order of business would be, where were you last night? I didn't get a call. I had to explain that I had fallen asleep. The last phone call I had with her was the day before she passed away. I was taking a walk with Marcia and my mom was in the ICU at Glenbrook Hospital. At that moment, it was looking like she was recovering. 
They, of course, did not have patient phone service in the ICU. I get a call and it is the ICU nurse telling me my mom wants to talk to me. I said, of course. She gets on the phone and says, quote, I am just lying here by myself and you're not calling me. I explained that they don't have phones in the ICU, but hopefully soon they will transfer her to a regular room and then she will get calls. She was good with that. I said that the nurse had told me you had some cream of wheat for breakfast. She says, I always have cream of wheat for breakfast. She was strong and with it and being herself up to the very end. Amazing. More random thoughts. A.E. Pi Parents Club. I went to college at the U of I in Champaign. I was a member of the A.E. Pi fraternity. Every year for Parents Day weekend, the A.E. Pi Parents Club put on a show for us. I can picture my mommy and dad up there on stage singing and dancing to the show tunes they wrote. The parents thought the jokes they wrote were very funny, but the jokes didn't usually get a big laugh from the students. This bothered my mother. She made sure I realized that those jokes were very funny. <laughs> piano concerts at Orchestra Hall. She attended the Sunday afternoon Panzer Concerts Fuhrers for many years. She went with my dad. When, I, when my dad could no longer attend, I took her to the piano concerts. My sister Susan also accompanied us. On the way downtown, she had similar thoughts every single time we got on the Eden's Expressway. Why is there so much traffic? Where are all these cars going? There must be an accident up there. In any event, we were never late to a concert. The seats for the concert were in the second row of the first balcony. Great seats, actually. Great view of the keys. But to get to the seats, you had to go down a very long and steep staircase. As my mom got older, it was harder and harder for her to traverse these stairs. She said she would never give up those wonderful seats. At long last, she finally agreed to the change of seats to the main floor. Crossword puzzles. My mom loved crossword puzzles, which was a big part of her life at the condo. When she went into the nursing home, she got the Chicago Sun-Times newspaper every day and worked on the crossword puzzles. When I spoke to her later in the day, she would report on how she did on that day's crossword puzzle. I have only two words I can't figure out. Then she would tell me how many letters and the clue for the missing word. I would rarely know the answer, but enlisted the help of my tech guru, my wife, Marsha, who many times was able to do a Google search and find the answer. Friday night dinners. For years, we went to my mom's house for Friday night dinners. When Marsha and I first got married, we lived in the city, only a block away from Grandma Block. We would pick her up, travel to Wilmette to my mom's house for dinner. Great memories. Songs. It is well known that my mother was a fantastic composer of songs and poems. We all know that my mom wrote songs for every family occasion, including weddings and bar mitzvahs. She would make copies of the songs for the entire audience so we could all follow the words or sometimes sing the words for her. Red River Valley, Blue Tail Fly, This Land Is Your Land, and Bicycle Bill for Two were some of her favorite melodies for her songs. I would like to end with a song written to the tune that I can remember my mom singing to us kids many, many times, which was, You Are My Sunshine. Here's to my mom. I love you so, a great mom in every way. I'm sure you know, ma'am, how much I love you. I will miss you every day. Thank you so much, Joel. That was so beautiful. It's now that we're joined by Muriel's daughter, Susan.
When my mom first went to the Abington nursing home, she was in a lot of pain. Eventually, she did feel better. I would go visit her most every day. We would talk, tell jokes, laugh, have lunch together, and played the card game Gin Rummy. She was very good at it. She beat me a lot. On March 12th, when I came to visit, they said no one is allowed inside anymore. That was 10 months ago. I was wondering if I gave her a good hug and kiss when I said goodbye on March 11th. That was the last time I would have touched her. Outside her bedroom window, there was a tree. She looked at that tree every day. In the spring, <clears throat> she watched the buds come out and then the leaves. Sometimes a bird would sit on a branch. She loved her tree, it was her friend. She then memorized a poem called Trees by Joyce Kilmer. I will read that to you. I think I shall never see a poem as lovely as a tree, a tree whose hungry mouth is pressed against the earth's sweet flowing breast, a tree that looks at God all day and lifts her leafy arms to pray, a tree that may in summer wear a nest of robins in her hair, upon whose bosom snow has lain, who intimately lives with rain. Poems are made by fools like me, but only God can make a tree. Thank you, Susan, so very much. And now we're joined by Muriel's daughter, Karen. I may, I may repeat some of the things, but they're still just as heartfelt. We just lost our family matriarch. This Saturday was her 98th birthday. Although she would, she would say, trade me in for 249s. <laughs> she frequently said, well, all I have left is my sense of humor. When we were on the phone, the conversation was lagging. She'd read from her pretty good jokes book. She loved children. When grandchildren or great-grandchildren came over, she would always have a little gift for them. At her condo, she had a pool and loved it when they came over for a swim. She did love learning new things taking classes all the way up through till before, right before she went to the Abington, going to museums and concerts. She had a piano concert subscription at Orchestra Hall for decades. I remember going when I was a little girl. First balcony, front row, I thought it was a front row, <laughs> seats one and two. She studied Judaism and was very knowledgeable. One Passover during the Seder, we had a Judaic quiz show. I believe she won. She liked to write songs, as you've been hearing. She wrote them for family and friends and put them to familiar tunes. Okay, Clementine was a favorite. But to be honest, I was collecting all of her songs and I counted at least 12 other songs that she did. <laughs> Family was also very important to her. She missed my dad very much, whom she met at U of I when she was 17. And he's been gone since 2001. When I was looking through her songs, I found the one stanza that tells just how important family was to her. 
Okay, well, it's to the tune of Clementine, and I am going to sing it. <laughs> it was only one stanza. Oh, my darling, oh, my darling, oh, my darling family. From the youngest to the oldest, you are very dear to me. Thank you so very much. And now we're joined by Miro's granddaughter, Mara. <clears throat> Muriel has touched so many people and played various roles in both her personal and professional life. But for me, she was Grandma Muriel. As a grandma, she was kind, generous, and always supportive, but also could be quite firm and definitely had her ways. <laughs> Throughout the years, Jeremy and I enjoyed numerous Shabbat dinners, holidays, birthdays, and also many sleepovers at the Valley View House. We were the only grandkids for the first few years, and then we're lucky enough to have Jennifer and Michelle join our farm. It was during our sleepovers and time alone with Grandma that we really got to know her. The four of us were reminiscing and sharing memories the other day. We all remember her famous silver bread box that was really a cookie box, always filled with Stelladoros, Swiss fudge and marguerite chocolate vanilla combination, and once in a while, breakfast biscuits. We remember riding on silly Sammy or trying to reach the pedals on the bike in the laundry room. And we all love to read the guest book in the downstairs bathroom. <laughs> Grandma loved the Cubs. She and Grandpa Haskell would take us to games, but don't ever count on getting a hot dog or peanut. Instead, we dined on leftover chicken, corned beef sandwiches, and mandarin oranges. She insisted on schlepping along. When we slept over, morning time was also another good memory. Before we could eat, we had to exercise. She would put on the alley cat record on the turntable and the jumping jacks and stretches would begin. Finally, we could eat breakfast, but no chocolate milk or pancakes to be found. Grandma liked grapefruit juice and fiber one cereal. If she was feeling a little crazy, we could have Cheerios. And while we're talking about food, Grandma never really paid much attention to expiration dates. You had to be real careful with what you found in the fridge. Brian remembers the first time he met Grandma Muriel at her condo. It was always the first, it was also the first time he ever drank a rancid Diet Coke. She loved to tell us stories about her childhood, teach us new things and show us a good time. We went to many plays, movies, concerts, the circus, the annual July 3rd celebration at Gilson Park, and of course, our favorite stop was the dime store. We could pick out any toy we wanted. 13 years ago, Seth was born. Grandma Muriel was now a great grandma, and from then on, she was known as Gigi. She came to visit us at the hospital. She held him in her arms and looked at his tiny face. The first thing she said was, hmm, I wonder what instrument he'll play. <laughs> then she mentioned how when he turned 16, she would be 100 and he could be her chauffeur. Gigi went on to have six more great grandkids, Danielle, Hayden, Jacob, Junie, Jack, and Sadie, whom she all loved so very much. I remember that day Gigi came to visit me and Seth. Before she left, she turned to me and said, 
hold on tight. The ride goes quick. I know at the time she was talking about parenthood, but today we are remembering her ride and I'm grateful to have been a passenger. Thank you, Mara. And then finally, Muriel's granddaughter, Jennifer. It's hard to imagine a world without my grandma, Muriel. For almost 40 years, she has been a pillar in my life, a true lady, a woman of valor. She has been a part of almost every milestone or big event I have ever gone through. Among a million qualities I loved, she taught me the importance of kindness and giving. Grandma was so kind. I don't think I ever saw her mad and she certainly did not hold grudges. She was a true humanitarian. She gave and gave to others and wanted only for everyone around her to be happy and joyous. Whether it was through tzedakah giving of her time or sharing a good laugh, she was always there. Over the years, she attended so many of my orchestra concerts. For the past eight years, I taught at a school very close to her condo, and she was able to come to many performances. I used to always tell my students to look out for my grandma, who would be in one of the front rows with my mom. I'd tell them if they got nervous, play for her. And if there was a soft moment to play so quietly, that my grandma would have to lean in to hear it. I told them that she'd be listening and I knew that, they, that she was. Grandma was so giving, she'd leave M&Ms out for all of us when we were young and still did it for her great, great grandchildren. Whenever I eat M&Ms, I'm taken back to her house on Valley View with the red carpet and the white couch. She gave to others whenever she could, especially to my grandpa Haskell especially in his later years when he got sick. The devotion that my uncle Joel talked about, she showed through that season of life is a lesson that I will never ever forget. And I've equally been touched over the years since my grandpa passed watching my mother take care of my grandmother. I'm so grateful that my husband Kurt and children June and Jack knew Gigi. We talk about her all the time at home and I really hope that they'll remember the happy times that we shared together. On the morning that she passed, I was finishing up my online teaching and a Chopin Nocturne popped up on my YouTube videos, which was strange because I don't really listen to Chopin. I thought maybe this is a sign. So I played it and I remember grandma playing Chopin Nocturnes and waltzes on the piano when I was younger. It was almost as if God himself had placed the video in front of my eyes exactly at that time. I pushed play and listened while I was wrapping up my morning of virtual teaching and cleaning up. I thought of my grandma as I listened to the beautiful haunting music and I felt peaceful, happy and sad all at the same time. Now that she is gone, I vow to let her memory live on in the joyous family moments that we all will share and through the music in our lives. I love you, grandma. Thank you so much, Jennifer. And as Jennifer stated, we have a term designated for people in our lives exactly like Mariel, which is Ashit Chayil, a woman of valor. Where this comes from is not only its poetic origins, but it also distinguishes those who are the guarantors of Jewish survival and liberation. And an Eshet Chayel, a woman of valor, testifies to the majestic role of Judaism, not only in her life, but in all of our lives. Muriel, Miriam Bat Chana, follows Miriam of our biblical narrative 
and Avigail and Deborah and Hannah, them and all of the myriads of Nashim Tzidkaniot, as we say, righteous women. As inspired by our heritage, Muriel lived a life of dedication and service to our tradition, community, and of course her family. On the horizon in our Jewish calendar is the holiday of Tu Bishvat. And you'll please forgive me, but it was either Karen or Susan that we were talking about this tree that actually stands right behind us here. On Tu Bishvat, it is a day on our Jewish calendar, which we call the birthday of the trees. It's the annual moment when we distinguish the age of trees because According to Jewish law, the first three years that a tree grows fruit, the fruit may not be eaten. And that same law applies to a tree that has been lifted up. It's been uprooted. It's been moved. When it's replanted, it becomes brand new all over again. And once again, you have those three years. However, Jewish law teaches that when a tree is uprooted, but a single root hangs on, even if it's just as thin as a thread, that is still the same tree. That is to say that when something leaves us, even if it feels like it's actually gone, there is still that thread there connecting us to one another. It stretches between where it is and where it was. And so here we are together to mourn the loss of a wonderful tree whose sweet fruit nourishes the generations of children and grandchildren and the great blessing of great great grandchildren muriel has been pulled away from us and torn by the ultimate tempest of death but not entirely uprooted because not one, but many, many, many roots firmly attach Muriel to her family and friends and community. As Merwin taught, your absence has gone through me like a thread through a needle. That your loss, Muriel, it stitches with colors to each and every person present, both physically and spiritually. And so you, here, both physically and then you joining us from home. You, her children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren are the guarantors that your dear mother, grandmother, great-grandmother will continue to live on in your hearts and through your deeds and give spiritual sustenance to the generations yet unborn. For you, Muriel lives on and will continue to live on in your hopes, in your homes, and your works. Your way of life and the beautiful Torah that you have shared here today, that is a credit to Muriel and your deeds connected to her, her life, which we know is everlasting. Muriel's work on earth was interrupted, but it was not terminated. You, her devoted family, are like those roots that bridge the chasm between what was and what will be. Being able to eradicate the loss of life by instead affirming love and life. I know all of us reflect back on Muriel's kind words intelligence, dedication to family, her amazing memory, passion, talent, love of music and songwriting. And all of that does not leave this world with her. Instead, it will find renewal in your kindness and the music that you sing, just as you did here today. Your commitment to your family and your connection to Jewish life and the Jewish people 
will continue to bring forth the fruits that we have also dearly loved. Our sages observe that as their children live, they too live on. May Muriel's memory be an eternal blessing to the family and to those she has touched with her warm heart and open hand. May her soul rest in peace and let us say, Amen. It's now that we will rise as the cantor leads us in the memorial prayer, the El Malay. El Male Rachamim, exalted, compassionate God, grant infinite rest in your sheltering presence among the holy and pure to the soul of our beloved Muriel, who has gone to her eternal home. Merciful one, we ask that our loved one find perfect peace in your eternal embrace. May her soul be bound up in the bond of life. May she rest in peace and let us say, Amen. Amen. It's now that we will lower her to her final resting place.
the trowel back into the earth and do not hand it to the person behind us because this is something that we must do from our own intentions.
It's now that we will recite the words of the mourner's Kaddish, which can be found in the handouts that you received. Yit Gadal v'yit Kadash Shemei Rabbah, Amen. Ve'alma divra chirute v'yamlich malchute v'chaye chon uv'yomei chon uv'chaye d'chol beit Yisrael ba'agala uv'izman kari v'imru, Amen. Yehe Shmei Rabbah Mivarach Leolam Ome Omaya Yit Barach Vishtabach Vipaar Vitramam Vitnase Vitadar Vitale Vitalal Shemei de Kudasha Barichu Leela Minko Birchata Vishirata Tush Bechata Benechemata Da Amiran Be Oma Vimru Amen Yehe Shlama Raba Min Shemaya Bechayim Alenu Vialkol Yisrael Vimru Amen Ose Shalom Vimromav Huya Ase Shalom Alenu Vialkol Yisrael Vimru Amen May the one who creates peace in heaven create peace here on all of on earth for all of us and all of humanity. It's now that I share these words that have accompanied our people for generations. May God provide you comfort as God comforts all the mourners of Zion and Jerusalem. May Muriel's memory be an eternal blessing to you, to all of your family and friends, to our community and the entire world. Together we say, Amen. This formally concludes our service here today. The family will be sitting Shiva virtually from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. The link can be found on the Chicago Jewish Funerals website. And so all of us can have access to join the family and extend words of comfort, as well as join together for our Mariv evening prayer service.